All right, this morning uh, we're going to do a, a topic. Uh, we're going to be looking at topicals through the 12 weeks of the Reformation series. And um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult because the, the um, subject this evening, as I'm, I'm going to review this for you in just a moment, is rather broad because it's an overview of the 17th and 18th centuries. So I had to kind of pick one of those topics, and so I picked one that I thought would be helpful to us, and I've already told you what, what that is. So let me read for you a text that I believe gives to us the principles we need to be able to um, deal with division, division within the congregation, division between congregations, and that's Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through 50. Let me read that for you now. Uh, this is God's Word. Luke writes, an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. Well, there's a lot in these passages that, or in these verses that I've just read, but may the Lord bless the parts we're going to be looking at uh, this morning to our edification, to our understanding, to our growth and grace. Now, last year, as you'll recall, it's hard to believe it's been a year already, for our Reformation series, okay, we watched together Michael Reeves on the English Reformation and the Puritans. You remember that? <laughs> a very good series. It gave us the opportunity to zoom in on an area of the Reformation that Dr. Godfrey really didn't have time to address. Now, I, sh I should say that's true and it's not true because um, what Dr. Reeves dealt with, dealt with the Reformation during the time of Luther and Calvin, but what was going on in England. Um, but he went beyond that into the Puritans. Now, Godfrey is going to go into the Puritans, but he's not going to be touching on it exactly the same way as, as Dr. Reeves did. So anyway, that's the reason why we looked at that series last year, and I hope, um, I hope you remember that. It was really quite um, entertaining, I would say. Uh, I, love, I love church history. But in it, let me just, just kind of provoke some you know, ideas in your mind by just remembering some of the key people that... Dr. Reeves was, was speaking of, that the Lord used to reform the Church of England. And remember that the Lord did this through friends of the Reformation. Uh, some of those friends were in the church, and I hope you remember William Tyndale, uh, Richard Sibbs, Thomas Goodwin, and who can forget John Owen. The ladies are still, I think, um, reading one of his books. But he also used political leaders. Uh, Edward VI, who sadly did not live very long, uh, but still promoted the Reformation. Elizabeth the, the I and uh, Cromwell, uh, the Lord Protector of England who governed after Charles I was beheaded. They all were used by the Lord to strengthen the Reformation movement, but the Lord also used enemies of the movement also to promote it. And some of those characters are recall Archbishop Laud, <laughs> in the church, and then those political leaders, King Henry VIII, Queen Mary I, known to history as Bloody Mary, because she martyred Protestants, King James I, Charles I, and Charles II. By the way, King, King James I is the, the king, I believe, who commissioned the um, King James Version, and he's kind of a mixed bag, but he did a lot to hurt the church, as well as some things to help it. Well, tonight, as I've said, we're going to begin another fascinating series in uh, church history by Dr. Godfrey that covers the continuing development of the Reformation in the 17th and 18th centuries. And as I've already mentioned, his first lecture is an overview that shows us some of the challenges that the Reformed churches or the Reformed church had to face 
as they continue to build on the foundation laid by the reformers. And I'm going to just mention what those challenges are, explain it just briefly, but he will talk about this this evening, and maybe it'll whet your appetite to come back this evening. Geographical challenges, um, as they begin to understand just how much of the world was yet to be reached with the gospel. So that's one area. Political challenges, as kings began to uh, want to rule without parliaments, uh, they wanted to rule with absolute power. Uh, the challenges of a divided church, and that's something that, uh, I was, uh, I, that I have been speaking about. Remember, until the Reformation, there was only one church in the West. Only one church. Well, which is the true church? You know, sadly, even the one church <laughs> was not all the true church. It was a, a mixed bag, but that was the Roman Catholic Church. But now, after the Reformation, there's the Reform, there's the Lutheran, and there are the Anabaptist churches raising that question, which is the true church? And that's something we want to look at this morning. Cultural challenges. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church up to this point had been that which um, held European culture together. It was kind of like the cement that held society together. But now that the church was divided, what was going to serve that purpose? And then the area that I enjoy perhaps the most, the theological challenges. There was a revival within Rome and within the Lutheran churches that began to challenge the teaching of the Reformed Church with increasing thoroughness. And it gives rise to um, one of the most interesting movements, I think, in the history of the church, and that is scholasticism where they begin to really delve into uh, the minute details of Scripture to try to answer very difficult questions, the questions that we often say, well, oh, that's something really nobody can know. It's too difficult. Eh? It may be difficult, but the Bible may actually provide the answer to those questions. And um, it, it's not that it's easy to understand by any means, but it is very interesting. Okay, this morning, uh, or I should say in the mornings, I've already told you we're going to try to touch on maybe one of the topics and maybe take a deeper dive uh, into the scriptures on that because you can only do so much in 22, 23 minutes when you're talking about great movements and great gaps of time. So I'm going to try to fill that out a little bit in the mornings. Uh, this morning, I'd like for us to deal with the problem of the divided church. Their problems were a little bit different in their day because they were faced with that for the first time. We've been faced with it ever since we've come into the church. You know, we've seen there's all these denominations and which one of these is a true church? Which one should I attend? And how should I view those who belong to another church? Well, from our passage, I want us to consider what the Lord would have us to do. And since the Lord in this passage deals with divisions with, among, you know, uh, let's say particular groups, I'd like to deal with that as well because I think the same, the same cure applies to both situations, how we deal with in-house problems or divisions as well as those that are between houses, so to speak, uh, even though we're all under the one rubric, so to speak, of the body of Christ. So first of all, let's look at how to deal with divisions among ourselves. And I think we do need to spend a little bit of time on this because the way that Jesus deals with it isn't immediately apparent. You know, why does he take this child and use him as this object example in order to deal with that particular subject? Well, we read in verse 46, an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. Well, you know, that's, a, that's something that really never concerns us, right, as far as um, our status in the kingdom of heaven. Well, certainly, it, I think we're all interested in it, and there's the right way to go about it, and there's the wrong way to go about it, and we're going to see that the disciples quite naturally went about it the wrong way, okay, and this is what Jesus is going to correct. Well, again, as they were traveling, the disciples were talking, and, you know, there isn't really much to, that much you can do while you're traveling, except talk. And as they did, a topic came up that was interesting, really, to all of them. Um, which one of them would be the greatest in their Lord's kingdom? 
Now, one thing we do need to understand about this is they really were not thinking at that time about the eternal kingdom of God, about what we see in Revelation 20, the, the saints that have been martyred, being resurrected, and re ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years, and this invisible spiritual kingdom that's in heaven. That is not what they were thinking about. And they were not thinking about a future millennium after Christ's return when they would be ruling and reigning with Him on the earth. They weren't thinking about that either. What they were thinking about was the political kingdom that they believed that Jesus was bringing when He would overthrow the Romans, remember, reestablish the kingdom of Israel, sit on the throne of His father David. When that happened, which one of us, Jesus, is going to be the second in command? That's what they were debating amongst themselves. Now, that's not just an abstract question. That was something that they were all personally invested in, and we know that from an event that took place not, not long after that, when James and John bring their mother to Jesus. And they say, she asked them, Lord, grant that my two sons may sit in your kingdom, one on the right and one on the left. Okay, so again, here's this idea of jockeying for position in the kingdom of heaven. And this was causing a, a division. Now again, we may not hold out that same hope for ourselves because we know now that they were mistaken. Jesus hadn't come to set up an earthly kingdom, and that's not what we should be you know, pursuing. But even when we think about the spiritual kingdom and the rewards that are ahead of us, okay, we, we may not necessarily think, maybe I am going to be the one sitting next to Jesus. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But uh, that, you know, I don't think we hold that, that hope out. But all of us do hope, I think, that the Lord will use us and that by serving Him, we might receive a, a full reward. I mean, we want to hear Jesus say to us on that day when we stand before Him, well done, good and faithful servant. In other words, we want honor, don't we? We want honor in God's kingdom. That's what they wanted was honor. We want it too. Now, Paul tells us that this is something we should be striving for in the kingdom of heaven. We should desire honor in His kingdom above all things. And I believe that's what Paul is referring to when he says in 1 Corinthians 9.24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? There's only one first place winner. But then Paul says to the Corinthians, run in such a way that you may win. You know, try to be the winner. Try to be first place. Try to be the one who gets the greatest honor. So honor is something we should be after in the kingdom of heaven. But in our striving to win first place, the question comes up, how can we keep from dividing with each other, okay? Because of self-interest, as the disciples were doing in our passage. How can we seek glory for ourselves and at the same time not cause division? Well, that is what Jesus is actually addressing in our passage in verses 47 and 48, though it's not immediately apparent. It is in, in the last statement, but in the first part, it's not entirely clear. Let me read for you again verses 47 and 48. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. Now, the one thing I want you to see is there is a relationship between that child and that last statement, the one who is least is the greatest. Now, Jesus saw that they wanted, you know, he saw what they wanted. They wanted honor, but he also saw that their motivation was not good, was wrong, sinful. Self-interest, something that we are warned against by Paul in Philippians 2, 3, where he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Well, seeing this, Jesus decided to give them an object lesson. After setting a child next to him, he said, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Now, you know, a lot has been made about Jesus using children as examples, and sometimes I think we, we go a little bit too far and don't understand that 
He's not necessarily referring to that child, but to perhaps certain qualities in that child. Okay? What did he mean by this child in this context? Was he assuming that that child is regenerate? Some people take that, you know, um, take that tact and look at this passage and say, well, all these children are either regenerate because they're children of the covenant, or maybe they're just innocent because they haven't yet gotten old enough you know, to reach the age of accountability and actually to become guilty. So Jesus is pointing to this child as this innocent, dove-like you know, uh, character that this child has. And again, I'll ask you, is that the way your children were? Uh, certainly was not the way that, that ours were. Uh, is that why they should follow that example? Well, I don't, I don't think so, because really, and again, this is, there's, you know, it's, there's a variety of opinions on this, but I think I agree with Jonathan Edwards that, that it's very rare for a child to be regenerate. That's a rare thing, okay? And as far as an age of accountability, the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. That applies to children as well as to adults. They need to be regenerated. They need to be saved. They need to be evangelized, okay? So the question is, what is it that Jesus was saying about that child? Why did he use him as an example? Well, I think it's because that this child was an example of relative purity in a particular sense. Because still being young, and the word that Luke uses here indicates that this child was under the age or was, had not yet reached puberty. By the way, has anything changed at puberty? Okay, yes. So, child was still relatively, you know, even keeled, I suppose you might say. But being under that, this particular age, he was closer to what it is that we should be than what the disciples were, okay? His sin and his corruption had not yet grown to the point that it would later. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, just think about, you know, if you were asked to teach a school, uh, you know, a classroom of, of students, you know, what, what age group would you want to teach? Would you want to teach toddlers, kindergartners, grade schoolers, middle schoolers, high schoolers, college, postgraduate, okay? Well, think about that for a minute and think about your own children. You know, at what age were they more compliant, easier to steer in the right direction? And I realize there are exceptions. <laughs> there are exceptions to that even when they're young. Some of them you just can't seem to get to go the right direction. Well, I think we understand the younger they are, the more compliant they are. And I think what Jesus was telling his disciples here was this, that they should behave more like children, like this child, in this particular regard, okay? And let me just read for you a parallel passage where Matthew is speaking about the same situation, but he adds a little bit more. He says this, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he was pointing to the child as an example of humility. Now, another thing that we need to realize here is this as well, that he may not actually be referring, I mean, he, he isn't actually referring to children at all when he is uh, talking about this, although he is for the example. Look at this child, look at the humility, be that way. Oftentimes, children get along better than adults do, okay? Not always, but, but often they do. And so Jesus is pointing to that because they're not trying to establish necessarily this, this pecking order. But I think what he is talking about here is the need for those who belong to him to put on this childlike humility. Now, I think that, that this is further strengthened by what he says in verse 47. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Now, here we need to ask the question, was Jesus talking about that child or children? Or was he talking about those who have a childlike humility who belong to him? Well, I think he was referring to, to the latter because Jesus does say in Matthew 10, 41, 
he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Now, I want you to notice here that in the name of a prophet means because he is a prophet. Jesus says here, whoever receives this child in my name, what he means here, whoever, whoever receives this child because he belongs to Christ is receiving him. Okay, so he's talking about here those who have this childlike humility who belong to him. Now, there could be children who fall into that category, but I believe he is, again, referring to his, to his disciples. If you put on this childlike humility, whoever receives you in my name because you belong to me is receiving me. And then Jesus goes on to say, if we receive him, we are receiving the Father who sent him. Now, again, let's not miss the overall point. His point is, to his disciples, we need to humble ourselves, even as, as this child, okay? Verse 48, for the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. Now, I just quoted part of what Paul said earlier, but let me read the rest of it, where he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. You can't do that without humility. So don't seek self-interest, but seek the interest of others. Okay? So answering the question, how can we run in such a way that we may win? How can we seek for honor in Christ's kingdom without losing that honor? through selfish ambition, because that's sinful. Well, the only way is by humbling ourselves. The one who humbles himself or herself, the greatest or the most, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. By the way, this is also what Paul meant when he wrote to the Romans in Romans 12, verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And then he says this, give preference to one another in honor. An alternate way of translating that is try to outdo one another in showing honor. Okay, so how do you get honor in Christ's kingdom? It's by trying to outdo one another in showing honor to each other. It's not in trying to ride over the backs of your brethren and become greater than they are. Instead of racing each other to the top, as it's done in the corporate world, we are to race each other to the bottom, to try to become a servant to each other, the best servant we can possibly be. Now, think about that in terms of divisions in the church. If you have this kind of love and this kind of humility that seeks to serve, we're not going to have the divisions because the divisions are caused by trying to gain things for ourselves, greatness for ourselves. And we know our Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect example. He was the one who humbled himself to serve his disciples. Okay, well, that's how we heal the divisions amongst ourselves. Secondly, and really to uh, Godfrey's point this evening, how do we deal with divisions between believers in different denominations? Well, after Jesus finished this object lesson, John asked him this, this additional question in verse 49. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. I think what's going on here is that, okay, Jesus, you just showed us how we need to treat one another, but what about those who aren't with us? How should we treat them? Now, one thing that's interesting to notice here that even as it was in the Old Testament, at least for a time, so it is in the New Testament, you know, when, when God singles out Abraham and he begins to deal with him and his line, these characters pop up that, you know, Jethro from Midian, who's a priest of God, and we have Melchizedek, who is a priest of God, and we've got the Job, you know, who was a contemporary with Abraham, and, and they're outside the covenant community, and they're worshiping the true God. And they were looked upon as true believers. Well, in the New Testament, we see something similar going on where Jesus had disciples besides those who were following him. 
You know, they weren't following, I mean, there were those who weren't following him physically who still believed in him and followed his teachings. We, we find later that Nicodemus, you know, was a secret disciple as well as Joseph of Arimathea. There were those who had followed John the Baptist and who heard him say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who may not have immediately followed Jesus, but eventually followed him. And what about all those people who were converted through the preaching of Christ and the disciples? Okay, not everybody took up, you know, packed up everything, or I should say left everything, and followed the Lord Jesus Christ physically, though they did in their hearts and in their minds. Now, we don't know exactly who this man was. We can't be sure, but he was a true follower of Christ. John's question is, should we oppose him because he is not with us? Jesus answered and said this, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. And Mark gives us a slightly fuller account in Mark 9, 39, where he says this, Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Now, again, there are some theological wrinkles in this. Um, Jesus was not necessarily saying the man is saved because there were those who performed miracles who weren't saved. But let's say, I think, for, you know, um, for the sake of argument, this person believed in the Lord because that's really... It applies in both senses, as long as they're professing or whether they're genuinely converted or not. This is what our attitude should be towards believers in other churches. Now, again, they may not be following us, okay? They may not believe exactly the same way that we believe, but if they've embraced the same Jesus, right, through the gospel, if they're trusting Him alone to make them acceptable to God, if they are following Him and serving Him from the heart, we do need to see them as our brothers and sisters in Christ, as our fellow servants in His kingdom, and we should humbly thank God for the work that He is doing through them. And again, let me remind you that Paul's told us already there are, there are many churches, many local churches, but there's really only one body, one invisible church. That's what we read in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are also called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This speaks of the unity of the body of Christ dispersed among many denominations. And of course, our meditation, even, for even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So even though Paul was perhaps you know, addressing this to particular churches when he wrote, it doesn't apply just to the members within that church. Christ has one body, and in Christ we are all one family. Okay. But then the question arises, how do we recognize a true church? Because there are a lot of denominations, or I should say there are a lot of groups, claiming to be Christians. Okay. I mean, for instance, if I were to ask you the question, what, what I've just said, how we should view other churches, should we apply that to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Should we apply it to the Kingdom Hall? Should we apply it to the Roman Catholic Church? Okay. Is it enough that they lay claim to the fact that they are a true church, and should we accept them just on the basis of that claim? Well, no, because in order to be a true church, they must embrace the true gospel. And we know there are certain foundational principles, certain non-negotiable, the things that we must go to the wall for, that we must be willing to die for, okay? That, first of all, the Bible is our only authority. I forget whether I, I just heard this from... Oh, yes, we, I think we all... Well, those of us who were here in the evening heard this from... 
Bob Godfrey. No, it was from Sinclair Ferguson, I think. Whenever you introduce another authority, that authority always trumps the Bible. So whether it's subjective, whether it's some objective standard outside the Bible, anything that's added to it will eventually trump the Bible, and it destroys its authority. The Bible is sufficient in and of itself. It's all we need for faith and life. We have to accept that. We have to believe in the true God, and the true God is the triune God, the one who reveals himself in nature and through Scripture, the one who gives us the gospel, you know, in which the eternal second person of the Godhead became one with us, being born of the Virgin, and lived and died so that all who trust in Him alone for their salvation and who show that they have trusted Him by following Him, by following His Word, would be saved. Now, again, we apply that test to these other churches, or I shouldn't call them churches, but to these other groups that I just mentioned, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons, although I understand they don't like to be called Mormons, but that's what we call them. They believe in many gods. They're polytheistic. Uh, they believe in salvation by work. So, okay, they are not a true church. What about the Jehovah's Witnesses? They do the same thing, except they believe they say in one God, but one God who is one person, that is the Father only. Jesus is a creature, and we are saved by our works. Okay, again, they don't pass the test. What about the Roman Catholic Church? Well, they believed in the Trinity. They believed the Son of God was born of the Virgin and became man. They believed He lived and He died. They believe we need Jesus. We need to trust Him. We need grace. Where do they fail? Well, they do not believe that justification is by grace alone because they do not believe we can be saved through faith alone. They believe we must also do works. Without the gospel... You cannot have a true church. That is the mark of the church, is that it preaches the true gospel. It, it believes and embraces this. Now, if a church does believe those things, if they do embrace those things, the point is we should embrace them as well. And if we want to heal our divisions that we have between other denominations, then we need to focus on the gospel that we confess in common and the work that our Lord has called us corporately to do. Focus on those things rather than on our differences. Now, let me just say in closing, we need to remember that all of God's truth is important. We need to learn it. We need to embrace all of it. We need to promote it as we have opportunity because every, in every area that we deviate, it's going to cause us some harm, isn't it? It's going to either rob God of some glory or it's going to lead us down a wrong path. We need to embrace God's truth as precisely as we can. Now, some of them we understand aren't going to be as impactful as others. Certainly, these that have to do with the foundation of the gospel, you can't be saved without these things. Other things may not be as important, but they are still important, and, and that is the point. But the gospel is the most important. It's through this that the Lord creates a new creature, one who loves and one who is genuinely humble. And that is what is going to unify the church, not only within, but also without. And so may the Lord grant that we may love one another, humble ourselves to serve one another, so that the world may know that we, you know, not just those of us who were here, but the church at large, that we are His disciples. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us to do this.